All right, guys. I'm curious about this. We're going right into it. Anthony Padilla and Oliver Tree. <laughs> silly last name. I have no joke. I'm just I'm being silly. Um, so I'm kind of curious about this little conversation. I kind of like Anthony Padilla's stuff. I watch it every once in a while. And Oliver Tree's an interesting feller. And I saw a clip of this on TikTok, actually, which just makes me want to watch. This is what makes me want to react to it. So, yeah, let's give it a shot. Play a character. I'm just, I still play a character. I'm just not a character right now. I am a real person. I'm on stage playing for 20,000 people. I'm going to be a character for sure. Mm, I don't really need it know. to always be one way or the other. There's we call it code switching, guys. We all kind of play a character, no? We're all a little bit different depending on who we're talking to. Our mothers, our fathers, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, our they friends, of course, our regular friends, um, teachers, et cetera, et cetera. It's just that, like, you know, the character is a little bit different than that, though. But Oliver Tree's character just seems to be him, but, like, super sensationalized. I feel like everybody does that, right? You could argue that people like Kai Sinat and I show speed, and they probably don't act like that in their everyday life. Somewhat similar, but they just exaggerate particular things about it to be to be more entertaining for people. So there's room for both to exist. True. I play a character too from Among Us. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you want to watch an extended version of this interview, because it, Sorry. it is a deep one, click the join button down below to become a member, just like all these amazing people. Anyway. Back to Oliver Jesus. Tree. Hello, Oliver Tree. Hello. Hello, how you doing? Doing good, how are you? Good. I feel like we're seeing a very different side of you today. The costume off. The costume off, the character. Yeah. Is, I mean, is, that, his, is that his real hair, though? That's, I mean, I'm impressed. That's the only thing I, I'm not like, cause you're just, I'm just impressed. I mean, I'm impressed. I'm almost jealous, you know? <laughs> oh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if I wanted to, I could grow hair like that, but I just don't want to. So I'm not really, I don't care. I don't even care. Scott, how does it feel sitting here on camera being genuine? You know, mm. not not being character. Your I feel character. like um, Oliver. It's not. Do you feel like you can even be genuine, or do you feel like that you're so involved in this character that you don't even know how to separate yourself? Hmm? That big of a deal, because this is how I talk to people all the time. Yeah. So it's just normal. The other thing mm. is more like, oh, I have to prepare. This is a lot easier. What does it even mean to be normal? You know, what does it even mean to be yourself versus the character of yourself? I mean, we can make a decision on changing the way we interact with the world at any point in time, and we do that so often. So like, how do you know that this is not the character, Oliver, and that the character that you think is a character isn't your real you? You don't. You're, you don't fucking know anything, okay? Pretty much do no prep. Do I don't have to bring, oh, dude, I'll do interviews where I film the interview with my friend asking me questions that I think they could ask. And I usually try to run the interview where I give them the questions to ask me. Sometimes I'll bring out, like I did what? Steve-O's what? thing. I interviewed him. I had a hundred questions written for him. So like, you know, this is very easy. It makes my life a lot easier. So you kind of over-prepare. I do it because I want to make it something special and I have to yeah. get all these props and these things. And it's like, Jesus, <laughs> could have just shown up with uh, a t-shirt. When I first started doing these interviews, I would do like 40 hours of research on the guest. And what, you did one that's hour crazy. on me? Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. You know, I, I pretty much got through your whole catalog that quick. Uh, found some nude pics in there, I don't know how that came up. In was there. it on that Spotify? It was on that's Spotify. That's crazy. Yeah. My manager did that, he's my old manager. Where could I see that, brother? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he should be fired because they didn't look that glamorous. Fired him. Yeah, yeah, he should be fired because they didn't look that glamorous. How oh, fucked up, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Old man. I was eating good. Yeah, I mean, you gained all this success and popularity as a character, as Oliver Tree, the character, the persona. Can you describe what that character was like? I mean, I feel like it was myself and authentic to me, but turned up to, I want to say an 11, but it's probably more like a 22 or something like that. But just taking crazy. everything that was true about my life. You really can't do that, though. They usually limit that 10. OK, I understand the exaggeration, but it's just not practical. So I'm sick of it. Life, but then <laughs> overdriving it, you know? So the haircut was the haircut I had my whole life. I was too scared to get any other haircut. The jacket was something I stole from my mom and my mom and my dad would wear it in the eighties. Like I have pictures of them <clears> skiing cool. with it. Um, so it was almost like a family relic. Oh, the pants were the pants I always wanted. The socks and sandals, that's like the shoes that were kind of the most goony shoes. And the glasses were like the little glasses I would wear as a kid that made me feel cool. So it was kind of taking all of the things that really was the most ridiculous versions of myself and kind of just like putting it into one place. And so it came out of necessity. Um, I had my my first opportunity to be in a music video where I would be on MTV. And I was like, how do I want to present myself? Do I want to try to sell sex and blend in with everybody? Or do I want to try to stick out like a sore thumb? I mean, I, I think he did made a good call not trying to sell sex. <laughs> you know, I don't know if he would have worked for him. I'm not even trying to be rude. I think I could pull it off because a lot of gay dudes think I'm hot and old women. I don't know what it is, but, you know. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many grannies are going, you want some candy? You know, they're reaching out and asking me for candy. But i diabetic, so I'd say no, but. I don't know. Maybe he could be hot. You know, maybe we don't. Maybe I just maybe I don't fucking know anything. Oh shit! I gotta run.
shit. Oh. Um, and do something different. And for me, I just felt like as an artist, I it didn't feel right trying to use like sexual attraction as my main device to try to get people to get behind my art. So I was just really turned off by that. And I decided, hey, I'm going to go with the route of like, try to look as ugly as possible. Hence this beautiful, ugly haircut that it I have. Did. It, it worked, work. you turned yourself into a meme? Yeah, and I can still make more memes, but like, you know, realistically, there's more than just the meme, you know? I kind of thought that your music would be shallow before I listened to it, just because I've just seen images, right, right. Just, like I've seen different you know, I have, clips. I, I haven't you know, I haven't even, seen any. I haven't even really heard his music outside of the stuff that I've seen on TikTok, you know? I'm not, he seems interesting. I think I saw a few things of him with uh, Ethan Klein. And they seem to have like a fun, like joking relationship. So the actual, I didn't sit down and listen to a full song until much later. And when I listened to your music, I was like, oh shit, this is like, this is deep. This is vulnerable. This is tapping into a place of genuine self-expression. You know, you know there, there is that creative art side that I can, I can see matches the visuals to a certain degree, but it felt yeah, so much more vulnerable and genuine than what I was seeing. Right. And I think in the music, you could see the real guy and get a sense of who I am much more. But then like the image was just the exact opposite. Yeah. And for me, that was actually fun because I'm so into the idea of juxtaposition, yeah. taking things that don't go together and trying to find ways for them to fit. Because in art, there's only so many songs that can get made. There's only so much lyrics and chord progressions that work in the pop context and just in general. So everything's played out. It's pretty much already been done. So I found as an artist, one of the few ways that you can do new things. Well, that's true in general. I remember when I went to like my game of web design school, the teacher was like, there's, you're never going to make anything that's not been done in some capacity before. <clears throat> I think even like I think it was Star Wars was I think the Series Seven or some fucking ridiculous movie or something. We every concept has, has effectively been tried for the most part. So anything that's new is really just a variation on something that already exists. It can still be innovative to some capacity, but <clears throat> is by meshing together things that probably shouldn't go together. And so when you look at my project, it's pretty much at the core a juxtaposition. Yeah. What was the goal with? The like me and my dad's pp character was the goal to create that, that mask to say like this is totally different than the sound it's that juxtaposition was it a way for you to kind of give something else for people to focus on while you were able to express that genuine vulnerable side yes i'm married of you <laughs> that's a good question i think the answer ultimately is as an artist my job is to put up a mirror in front of society so okay. to show just how ridiculous and how stupid things have gotten i kind of had set that mirror up to show society hey this is kind of like an extreme version of where we're at right now so i've never seen his music really so i don't know if that's i, I don't even know if I, what, what is he referring to that's that would have that deep of a meaning we fully dove in with the, the character it was really to grab attention and have them then pay attention is he really that deep or, or maybe i'm just maybe i'm fooled by the uh the, the clownish facade or something you know? the lyrics and Who's the, I guess audiences right yeah it was just a way to see like okay like for me I think it also stemmed from I spent many years of my life with another project and I tried to take myself so serious and I was like oh my god like why won't anyone take me serious as an artist like this is so uh, like mad at the world you know and trying mm. this angle and I think like when you're focused in, hyper-focused on trying to do something and it's not working you have to look and find another exit or entrance in so it's like um, yeah, true are you familiar with the idea of the quantum leap? Tell me about it. I'm not super well versed, but a friend gave me a book and I don't read books. I was like, bro, I'm not going to read this. He's like, you got to read it. It's only 40 pages. I was like, I'd like to the say. The only book I've ever really read. Well, I mean, I've read books when I was growing up, but in my adult life, I, <laughs> I don't know why I was going to say it's like World of Warcraft books. <laughs> it's so cringe. Like I read like a, a Richard, uh, I think it's Richard Nark or Richard Nack's books about uh, his lore videos. And they're actually surprisingly good. It's fucking crazy. They're really deep, so that's why I was into those for a while. So I don't yeah, care. I'm going to, but I'm Lord. not. But I did read the first two pages. Oh, okay, but well, you the, got enough. You I got, got enough from that. <laughs> the first two pages is, talks about a fly trying to get out of a room. So okay. it's stuck in this room and it's at this window and it's hitting the wall of the. Bro, I'll leave you on. I, I remember there's times where like I'm in my car and there's somehow a fly or something got in there, so I'm trying to get that dumbass out and I'll open the window. It just won't go out. It's just so stupid. You know, it'll, it'll bang its head into the window, and when once I start opening the window, it goes to the windshield. And then I'll close the window and it goes back to it's just a little asshole. The window mm -mm. and the same result time after time. And the idea of the quantum leap is not necessarily to figure out how to get through the window, but to find another entrance or exit of that room. So if the fly goes around and finds there's maybe a door or another way out. So for me, like the way I look at it is like the idea of entertainment is 360. It's a circle. So like trying to find these different ways to penetrate into the center to try to get to whatever the goal is. And so for me, every time I That's try true. something, it's trying a different angle slightly and I keep trying to go. So I was like, oh, this didn't work. I'm going to try to go this way now and this way. And like, that's why my style is very eclectic because I'm just constantly one failure after another trying to figure out how mm -hmm. to break into the place I want to get and how to get. I mean, that makes sense. That's just uh, in general, just kind of fail until you succeed, right? Every failure is, an, is just an understanding of what you're not successful at, right? get there and it 
it's never there. It's never close. But there's certain times where in the reaching for the impossible, you reach the impossible. And it's very few. It happens very rarely. Okay. And I don't use the word success very much. I, I use the word failure and not in a negative way. For, for me, everything is a failure. Unless that. those one or two things that are like life-changing success. But I don't have negative connotation around the idea of failure. That word isn't bad. For right. me, the biggest part of success is failure. That's how you get to success. You said that it was to sure. get to the goal. Have you put words to what that goal is? Uh, for me, the goal is to inspire as many people as I can while I'm alive. And so that's why it's like the need of the shift of like, okay, how I present myself isn't serving me to make the greatest impact. If I'm just gonna always be that people, there's gonna be a large margin of people who are always off put by that. So the greatest inspiration that I can make as a human in harness is not gonna be able to be reached if I'm just stuck in that character, which is very one dimensional. You know, mm -hmm. it only shows a small part of my range, especially like if I'm here doing an interview with you and now what, I'm gonna put you in a headlock and we're gonna fight and that's like every interview I do. <laughs> yeah, he's showing the Ethan thing. Yeah, I don't know, man. Because I, I, Anthony said that his content is much deeper than we all think, but it doesn't really seem that way. I I don't know. I personally, I feel like that would be like if I was like, uh, hey, guys, I really am here to inspire you. I was like, what do I do that's so inspirational? I'm a fat fuck that you know, reacts to content. Um, obviously, he's more talented than me because he makes you know real content. But my point being is what is the, you know, who's going to feel inspired by that? Or I guess there's different types of inspiration. Maybe I inspire you. To be a fat fuck that <laughs> reacts to videos and plays World of Warcraft, and if that's true, then you know what? What a beautiful, what a beautiful thing, you know? What a beautiful thing, guys. Do for the rest of my life. I kind of did that and got it out of my system, and there's still room for me to go back beautiful. to that, depending on what's the right setting for that. How would you know if you reach that goal, or is there ever going to be a time when you're satisfied? And you're like, reach that goal has been reached. The goal won't ever be reached, but that's not the reason why I do it. The reason why I do it is because I have to do it, and I'll do that till I die. It's just a like drive within you that you can't escape. It's just like, you know, why do you drink water? Why do you eat? It's just part of our survival, like for me to survive. Sure, I mean, I feel like that's kind of a man thing more than anything else. It's just even when you're successful, they're just constantly, uh, okay, constantly engage in success. Why the fuck would this idiot start that? Okay. Five is to create. And like, I thought about this recently, like something bad happened to me and I was really bummed. And I thought about music, for example, and music is the one thing that's always there for me. Music has kept me alive, realistically. Mm, man, I, I feel like we just need to sit on how many remixes have been made of Miss You. It's insane. How many, are there like hundreds, thousands? Well, I was actually working very hard to break the world record. Oh yeah? I was trying to break, I think it was 144 by Madonna. And I think we got to 141 or something what? like that. You need just three hundreds? And I, I feel like we just need to sit on how many remixes have been made of Miss You. It's insane. How many are there like? Oh, I think that's the one. I've seen that. Um, so. Hundreds? Thousands? Well, I was actually working very hard to break the world record. Oh, yeah? I was trying to break. I think it was 144 by Madonna. And I think we got to 141 or something what? like that. What? You need just three more? We were, three more. And we're Bro, so close. If you're watching, we just need three more three remixes more and we break the world record. The crazy thing about that song was that Miss You is a remix of a song that I had made four years before with Marshmallow. And then... This kid, South Star in Germany, he remade the song. He remixed it, uh, but he took my name off of it and then he changed the title. He released it and then it became super big. My label was like, hey, we need, this is a remix of Oliver's song. And then they were like, oh, well, we're just gonna have someone re-sing his part. And now it's a cover. And then what was crazy was I didn't even care. I had nothing to do with this. I didn't know anything about this. This was all happening behind the scenes. Since the other label replaced my vocal, my label this is what I saw on TikTok that was like so interesting to me and how fucking music even works and how the law or whatever works around it too. I can't imagine that anybody would get away with it. It's so weird. The song and said, we're going to replace your beat and recreate it. So then they made this song and then they took it to me and they were like, hey, we want to, here's the song that went viral and we want to release it. Like the official version. Here's the official version. And they didn't say who, I didn't even know who South Star was or who the other person on the song was who had recreated it. They just had some initials. And I was like, can we just change it to make it say the original song title? And can we have my name on it and call it a remix? And they're like, yeah. well, no, the song's already so big. We can't do that. And I was like, all right, I guess that's not that big of a deal. So a week later it comes out and I look at the YouTube comments and it's just like, you stole this song from South Star. I'm like, who is South Star? And how could I have stolen my own song that I had made? So I was just confused. I was like, what the hell? And I was like seeing all these comments and I call my manager. I'm like, bro, what is going on here? We got to take this song down. I don't know what's going on here, but like, I don't want any part of this. And then like, you know, my manager was talking with the label and they're like, it's all good. Like it's all being resolved. 
and it will be resolved soon. I was like, okay, cool. And then like, well, that sounds like there's some kind of a legal issue going on. It sounds almost like his managers decided they wanted to try to strong arm the situation. They're like, well, he kind of stole from us, but maybe they were legally allowed to steal from us. So we're going to kind of counter it. Maybe it's not worth a lawsuit. So we're going to kind of counter it by like stealing what they stole from us in a different way and then calling it parody and then doing this. And then after we engage all that, we'll try to settle with them and out of court and try to have, come to an agreement. That's what it sounds like. A week passes and the song starts going crazy more viral and then crazy and it just and I'm like what's up with the song here? A lot of people are upset here. A lot of people hate me for this. I don't have anything to do with this. And then it just kept being like, oh, it's being sorted out. It's all good. <laughs> just sit easy. The song's doing its thing. We're gonna people get it for a minute. It's okay. <laughs> and I just like and it kept going. And every week I would keep calling and being like, how's things with this resolution here? Is it worked out? And they're like, yeah, we're right there. Everything's been inked up. And so like it was this never ending thing and like. I even talked with the kid as well. So what the hell is the resolution, bro? I'm curious. Or did they maybe it's a private resolution. Well, and we both were like kind of strapped up in the middle of a war between two labels. It had nothing to do with us. Uh. It wasn't even like he wanted to switch the vocal, but then his label made him do that. And then so the whole thing was a very weird situation where it wasn't like I had stolen anything. And, and initially he had kind of taken my song and taken and done whatever he wanted with it, which, you know, I'm not going to say that I was stealing either, but like no one stole anything. It was just how art gets made now is like you take from something, you put your spin on it and you put it out. Exactly. I agree with that, bro. That's exactly how <laughs> you take somebody else's stuff. And then you put a spin on it, dude. Okay. Is, is that any different from somebody reacting to a video, dude? Is that any different from an amazing reaction streamer? Okay. An incredible, transformative, handsome, thick reaction streamer reacting as a streamer? Is it or is it not? And we were both kind of just caught in the middle of this war. It was a very weird situation. Did it get resolved? Yes, finally, it got resolved. And it was crazy because they're like, it's resolved now. And then I was like, cool. And I was like in Berlin where the kid is uh, from in, in Germany. And I was like, we resolved this. And like, oh, oh it's not an incredible cope. How is it a cope? Fundamentally, what I'm saying makes a thousand percent sense. Shut the fuck up. Okay, don't don't cope. Don't hit me with the fucking the C word. Um, All right. Gets bought by you, he gets money. And when you buy his song, I get money. And, yeah. and, and then like he, he like hit me up, he's like, what's up with this? Why are you saying this? I was like, this is what they told me. Yeah. And he's like, it hasn't been resolved yet. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but anyways, after time, I think it's been like probably eight, nine months. It was finally- I think it's been resolved. Has it been resolved? resolved like a few months ago. Officially resolved. Yeah, officially. One thing that I noticed- I was it resolved. Videos, it, he prob they probably resolved it like out of court or something, like with some kind of NDA. I'm curious though, maybe we can know. This imagery of you falling to your death. Mm -hmm. Damn. Is there anywhere that that comes from? Does that represent anything? Because yeah. in my childhood, I had a lot of nightmares where I was always, I was always falling mm -hmm. to my death, and like I'd wake up right when I hit the ground. I was a child, I'd jerk off a lot. I was, I was a weird kid. I, so, sorry. Falling you, off your the body slide. jolts. Yeah, I'd, wa I'd yeah. wake up. I get those still. I feel like that imagery. There's something about it that's like eerie. When I was a kid, I would get these dreams, and sometimes I get them as an adult, where I would be faced with a confrontation. Uh, with somebody and I would punch them as hard as I could and it just wasn't very hard uh, I would punch them and then it just would never enough and they would beat the shit out of me sometimes and I just would try I would put all my force into it and they, it just wasn't enough I would never it was never enough it was so distressing I don't know I don't know why that happens but it was annoying as shit <clears throat> but nostalgic at the same time I don't know is this like a common thing that you I've explored with? death a lot especially in the first album um, I explored death heavily because yeah. I think ultimately that's why people go to religion and a lot of different things it's like Probably. what happens after life and so as an artist it's something that I ponder and true to process the thoughts and especially because I've lost people in my life when I was younger um, and it was pretty heavy duty for me that was I always a big that. thing of like well what happens after life and almost in a way preparing myself for my own death and so yeah I get that you know, that happens. Um, I feel the same way. For me, I mean, like, my aunt passed away when I was, like, 15, but we had a bad relationship. So my mortality really started to come when my Zhaji passed, but then especially when my uncle passed away. And then, actually, for me, when I really, when mortality and death really meant something to me was when I met my wife, when I got married, really. But when I met my wife, especially when I got married... And I realized, like, this is, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I actually have, I felt like I had some skin in the game for the first time in my entire life. It was when my, my wife, I loved somebody. I didn't want to not be with them anymore, you know? So that's really when I, when I learned about my mortality. This is scary, man. Being in love is scary. It really is. It's a very scary experience sometimes. So. Kind of like putting myself into those scenarios and kind of living it. 
so that I could kind of experience it and process it so that it's not such a big deal because mm -hmm. death is like something, that, especially in the West, we don't really know how to talk about it. And it's kind of something we sweep under the rug and it's like, well, someone died and we go to the funeral and then let's not really talk about it too much, you know, it's or scary. yeah, let's, let's remember the good memories, but let's not talk about the death side. And in the East in certain religions like Buddhism, it's like they're spending their life training for death almost, you know, how do we oh, like, try to like skyrocket the farthest we can when we pass and how do we make the next life better and so much is centered around death. So during the period where I was making tons of art around death, I was posting a lot of stuff around death and one idea that got proposed. Is death that taboo in our culture? Um, okay. To be posted on my page was a picture from a funeral um, that had my face and name on it and I had no idea what this image was from. I did not make this image. Someone brought to my attention that this was an edited picture of a funeral of an artist. Um, and the second that I found that out, I immediately took it down. I apologized to that person and I made a post and said, Hey, you know, the image that I posted, I'm, I very much sincerely apologize. It just, it's a horrible situation. I, I no sincerely apologize to the family, the artists, their fans. This was not an intentional thing. I had no idea what this source image was from, but I saw it. I didn't ask twice about where the image came from and it was posted <clears> on my account and Honestly, the biggest regret of my entire career. This is something that I can't even put into words. And just, you know, something that has just left a huge smear on something that I've tried so hard to create a place to inspire people, make people laugh, make people <clears throat> feel, and make the world more colorful. And I've tried so hard to pull people from their grief. Meanwhile, something like this gets posted on my account and just created so much grief for people. And the part that makes it really hard too is it was unintentional. There was no intention of hurting someone or hurting anyone. It was just something that was- I mean, so I'm hearing somebody yeah, Photoshop them into like a picture of someone else's funeral and then he posted it and then he kind of felt bad. Okay. I mean, it's not good, but it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. What It seems interesting that he's so distraught about it. I mean, he seemed to have done everything that he could in the right way to, you know, make good for it. So I was posted those super uninformed and, and yeah, I learned a lot from that. I learned that even if you have no following, it doesn't matter. This is something that still could have a big effect and it doesn't matter if you have one follower or 1 million followers, you should know what everything gets posted on your account is from, and you should make sure that sure, yeah. it's something that isn't gonna cause grief to people. Quick fact, Rocket Money is sponsoring this episode. Most people think they're spending about $80 a month on subscriptions when it's actually closer to $200. I yeah, true. I actually just went through all my stuff manually and found that I had a ton of shit that I was <laughs> subscribed to. Um, And uh, yeah, so I just, <laughs> It's it's a lot. It was like probably like forty bucks worth of shit, and then I was like, "Damn, we had like we had two Spotify <laughs> subscriptions and everything." It was fucking weird <laughs> for years, man. It's nuts. It will be the first to admit that I am one of those people who realized that they were being double charged for things I didn't even remember signing up for. Like, I guess I signed up for Spotify with two different emails and was getting double charged. Yeah. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel the subscription. This is a thing. Look in the middle of this video. Um, <clears throat> I was, <laughs> I got kicked out of this group because they started an escort quest without me. And I said, why didn't you tell me? And he's like, oh, sorry, we were all there, but you, I was like, so why not just mention it to me? He's like, chill. I said, I am chill. You're just a fucking moron. So they kicked me from the group. <laughs> so I, I still agree with myself. Descriptions. Hey, is it going to help me if I have dual subscriptions to my favorite OnlyFans model? That you don't want with just a single press of a button. No more long hold times or annoying yeah. emails That's with good. customer service. Rocket Money does all the work for you. Rocket Money can right. even negotiate. All right, all, right, all, right, all, right. all right, guys. Rocket Money, if you want to go just, uh, code Anthony Padinas and the, just the thing. Also, Rocket Money, give me, a, give me a sub for that, an ad for that for my podcast, my wife. Okay, we do... Lots of views, 1,500 to 2,000 per week on our podcast, plus segments, okay? So, I mean, come on. That's crazy. It's better than this guy who only got 280K on his every video. <laughs> it's fucking nuts, dude. It's a fuck. Uh, but anyway. A lot of death and hardship in your life. Is that you mentioned? Help, H -E -L -P dot com slash slash Padilla. 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 Now back to the world of Oliver Tree. All you right. mentioned that you've you, you dealt with a lot of death and hardship in your life is that you mentioned that you're sober you used to have all those addictions mm -hmm. i don't know if you're fully sober i am fully sober nice. yeah i do cool. drink coffee but Damn. that's well, it that's pushing it i know yeah. but well, if you watch that saved by the bell episode coffee is horrible you know yeah i mean <laughs> i think weed has been encroaching three years mm -hmm. um alcohol two years um tobacco was like the hardest one for me to cut off that was like um i would say okay. it's been like 10 months or something but okay. i mean hard drugs and everything has been like 
few years as well, maybe okay. four or something like that. But I was getting confused. I'm like, is he just talking about dealing with like alcohol and cigarettes, which is not good, especially alcohol. But I was like, it, doesn't, it sounds like I thought you guys were talking about like crack, but it seems like maybe they were. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to get off <laughs> substance for me. I like struggle with it, and I, um, I've done every drug under the sun. Were you numbing? Yeah, for sure. I started getting into drugs after my cousin passed away and I was like, I could Damn. die at any moment and like, what else does this life have to offer? Yeah. I think that was my excuse of trying to numb the pain of that. And so like before that, my friends were like, we're going to smoke weed. And I was like, whoa, 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 we're, we're definitely not. And they would go out and smoke without me. And so like I was like, Loser. raised with the right. <laughs> For me, you know, I hate smoking weed. I think it's terrible. And the only reason is because one time I don't, I never smoked before, but one time um, I got like a bar, I got a weed bar, right? I think it had like two or 250 milligrams of it, right? So I'm sitting in bed with my wife and um, I'm thinking like, oh, let's try this out. And she's like, yeah, sure. Why not? And so, you know, she takes a bite um, and I take a bite and I'm like, I'm not really feeling anything. So I ate the whole thing. So I ate probably like 200 plus milligrams of it. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't remember what we're watching, but maybe a half hour later, all of a sudden it starts to hit me and uh, I start to shake back and forth, you know, and I'm kind of feeling okay. And then it starts getting real bad. I'm shaking back and forth. And I, all I can tell you is that uh, my feeling, like my thoughts or my feelings, everything was, became very binary. Uh, I started going through movements in decisions of two, right? So like I would I would I would um rock back and forth and then I would rock side to side and then I would rock back and forth and then I would rock side to side and I would make a decision of which one of these makes me feel better and then I would keep doing that and then and I also have OCT I have ticks I have like you know and everything too so on top of that I'm ticking pretty crazily and I'm I'm deciding which tick feels better so you know maybe I don't have the tick where I, I have to circle through all my nails right or the tick where I have to um you know stimulate my the, my the, right, right below my palms my wrists <clears throat> And I'm just making decisions like that back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I remember that the color of the world started to fade. And <laughs> the color of the world started to fade. At the same time, I had to get up and go to the bathroom because I think I might have had to throw it up. And when I say that, I don't mean that like I don't remember. I mean like I don't. That's how I felt. I was like, I think I might need to throw up. But my wife is high, so she, and she could tell that I'm so fucked up that like I need help. But she's laughing. But she gets me to the bathroom, and I'm a big guy. I'm six foot four. I'm 350 pounds. And my wife is just not that. And so she gets me into the bathroom, and I'm just standing in the bathroom, staring into the sink. And I don't really remember getting to the bathroom, but I remember being in the bathroom, and I'm just staring at the sink. And I remember that. There's a little bit of paint in my sink from when we painted one time and I just never got it off. So I looked at that, but it was black and white. And I remember feeling horrible. And I remember just kind of thinking about my existence and like, what is it that I do for a living? And I'm a streamer, right? So I just sit there. I'm like, I, what do I do? I just, I just talk into a box and then other people hear it. And that gave me, that tripped me the fuck out. And then eventually color started to fill the world once again because I was throwing up and as I was throwing up I could start to perceive very vibrant colors again um you know and that was my experience with greening out man so I don't like weed the smell of it makes me sick I was high for like three or four days after that and uh I it kind of just fucked me up so it fucked me up though man I probably shouldn't have eaten so much, but uh, damn, you know, I don't know if I'll ever do it again. So. Ideas, but you know, we have to go down those paths ourselves and someone can say, don't do that, but you kind of have to learn it on your own. And and also, yeah, touching on the death thing, it's like I had a, enough experience where I did enough drugs and I was kicked out of my parents' house in high school and they like threw all my clothes out and they were damn. threw all my DJ gear on the, naked. I used to be a dubstep DJ back in oh, the hell day. Oh yeah, it was with Skrillex, nice. right? I played with Skrillex, yeah, in high school. But it was one of those things where like even that scene, you're like around all these people that are basically zombies. They're like dilapidating themselves. Each time you see them get more decrepit, they're like, oh, like tripping out. And so you're kind of just like, damn. what am I contributing with this? And then once I like, I there's a story and I won't get into it, but it's like I had a rebirth at Burning Man where I went on a family vacation and I ended up 
taking way too much acid and a lot of some other drugs as well. And I was running naked through the desert. And then basically I watched my funeral play out and like my death. And I went to my own funeral. And so these things played a huge factor Damn, in what the fuck? my storytelling with death. But ultimately I'm working on other things as well. And death is so intertwined with that because I'm still trying to understand my experience with what I've seen and what I've seen through those trips mm -hmm. and being able to kind of like let that play out through hey. my life. Cause it's such a only trips. I'm trying to see things through our Disney trips. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Disney adult, am I right? A profound thing. And I guess we're always just preparing for that moment. What did seeing your own funeral, your own death teach you? Well, the best part of that story was that um, I woke up the next day and I was alive. And I got to say, oh my God, That's I'm wild. alive. Like I, my body was covered in cuts. My head was warped. I was trying to pull my head open to pull my brain out of my head. Oh. And my head was like warped and my whole body was covered in cuts from my feet to my, literally my face. That alone was something that made me Jesus rethink Christ. everything. I'm like, no f way, I get to be alive again. I get another shot at being a human. So that was like kind of where I really shifted all my attention and energy over to music. And that's why for me, music is like a religion. It saved me in those moments of darkness. In those that's fucking crazy. That is actually fucking crazy. I mean, what an interesting experience. Um, Cause I felt like I was gonna die too when I got high, but I didn't have that perception of like, oh, I lived, I'm gonna make the best of it. It was like, damn, that was fucked up. I'm never gonna smoke weed again. That was horrible, you know? moments where I had nothing and was that one friend that was there for me that could always lift me up and, and gave me something to harness that energy yield that negative energy that wanted to go in and just like pretty much just self-harm myself but instead pouring it into something that I could be able to share with others you mentioned that the music creating the music has saved you saved your life it's put it's allowed you to put your energy towards something one thing I feel like a lot of people don't talk about is that you know the, in the creative expression process you are releasing emotions that otherwise would kind of be trapped right. within you can you talk about the process of putting these those emotions out instead right. of holding them in? So the greatest part of making art is the idea that you can be filled with so much negative energy and feel so much pain, suffering, which every human does. And you can harness all of that and create something out of seemingly thin air and turn all that negative energy that's bottled up inside you into something beautiful that makes you want to move and dance and cry. And like when I make music, by the end of the night, when I'm finished, the I feel the same way, but that's I, what I do instead of make music, I jack off. I just jerk off and it, it satisfies that getting the angst out i just fucking if i feel like i really need to have some really good expression with it i'll just put my 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 ankles above my head and kind of do it and i look like a you know if y'all it's kind of like ready, ready to get basted you know so the song i'm literally just like oh my god play it again play it again and i'll listen to it like 20 times yeah. and i'll listen to it on the ride home and when i get to bed i'll lay in bed and listen to it and if it's really good i'll know because the next day i'll wake up and start listening to it again but pretty much that's the experience is i make it for myself exactly where i'm at at that point in that moment in time and it's made to my exact taste that i love in this moment and the suffering and pain i'm going through and we're not that unique it turns out we think oh man my problems are so big and everyone is living such a different life but like we aren't very different we all are happy, we're sad, we're mad, we eat True. food, we have sex, we go to the bathroom. And it's not lucky. that complicated, you yeah. know? So whatever you're going through, there's billions of other people, if not every single person that's felt those feelings. You know, obviously there's unique anomalies and people who are dealing with other things and, you know, not to say we're all exactly the same, but we're not that complex. So whatever you're going through, there's a very mm -hmm. high chance that most people also maybe are not going through at that moment, but have gone through it or will go through it. And so that art piece will be relatable to them at one point of their life. That point that you made about, True. you know, putting all of your energy, whether, you know, whatever pain, suffering, emotionally you're feeling in that moment, translating it into a song, into sound waves, into something that's not even physically there, but it completely transforms the way that you feel and changes that emotion, that pain, that suffering into something that you can feel something positive from. You could dance to it. You can connect with it in a way where it, it changed that form from something negative. That energy is now not negative. It's something that feels positive. I think that's just so... Interesting. I think that is, you know, the, the power of art, and that is why so many people connect with your music. With, you know, you, you have lyrics that are dark that that express the pain that you're going through. But yeah, it's it's almost addictive to to listen to it. You know, like I, I have not been able to get your song "Miss You" out of my head for like the past two weeks. Me neither. But that's just kind of how I am with any type of media. When I hear, like, I like for for a phrase or a sound or something gets into my head, and then about a week or two later, it's it. it like it, it doesn't get into me there instantaneously. What will happen is it's like a phrase or something will kind of get in there. I'll hear something and then like I won't say anything. And then three weeks later, I just can't stop saying it. So Among Us Balls was really big for me for like about a month. I just kept saying Among Us Balls, Among Us Balls, Among Us Balls. Um, because my wife said Among Us Balls once. <clears throat> and so like, yeah, that was his music too. 
But it wasn't because of any type of deepness. It was just catchy as fuck. So. And you have lyrics that are like, don't fret. I don't. Is ever- it really all, is this really that deep? Or is this guy just a, a, a fucking a class five glazer? And that's fine either way. I'm not like saying he's a bad guy or anything. I'm just saying, is this just like, is this just glazing him? Is he glazing the fuck out of my man? I want to see you and I never want to miss you again. Okay. One thing, when you're angry, you're a jerk and then you treat me like I'm worth nothing. You know, you have these lyrics that are- com- Is that that deep? I mean, I feel like that's normal. It's like, hey, you're mean sometimes. It's a relationship. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying like, where, you know, give me some depth. You know, give me some Romeo and Juliet. Right, taking your life because you think that your loved one is dead, and then it turns out that they didn't, but you're dead now. So they take their. That's fucking wild, relatable too. That's deep. That is just really like a a, a look into the soul and the perspective on how beautiful love is, right? But you know, Coming are you reading that? He's reading it off not. the thing. That is straight from my head. You thought you could that get is away straight with from it. my head. I would never read lyrics behind your head that I put behind you. Never. So those yeah. those lyrics. These lyrics really uh, they really uh, sat with me. So I wrote them down because I forgot them. <laughs> just so I didn't forget them. They're, they're really impactful on me. They're painful. You know, if you just break it down to just the words. If I were to read that in a letter that someone gave me, I'd be like, "Damn, this person is." Damn. Was feeling. I would say this person's a class five fucking clinger. I'm breaking up with him. <laughs> Fuck him. In such pain, and I'm I'm sure you you remember to some degree the pain that you felt in writing those lyrics, but you changed it into something that's catchy that people get behind that they. They, that's addictive to listen to and dance to. I think about that often. It's about harnessing energy and yielding as much of it as possible and pushing it into something else. Because it's the time when you need the music the most. So it's like, I find too, and I would be falling in love. And I've fallen in love many times throughout my life. I think five or six times now. That's interesting. I've really only fallen in love once. Um, I thought that I f- fell in love before I met my wife. But I never really fell in love. You know, it was like I... Th- fell in what I thought was supposed to be love and I kind of just imitated a relationship and I think that that led to tough relationships because you know when you're with somebody that you're not compatible with you bring out the worst in each other um, and then you guys just get worse and worse and like shittier and shittier and then I you know I met my wife and and, and I, I was I, I'll say I wasn't really happy or proud with myself and then you know as we got together i became more prideful in who i was and i became a i think a better person and i fell in a very true love and falling in love with my wife for the first time made me really question my mortality it made death very real to me because i didn't want to not be around her and i don't even care if i die i just want to somehow stay with her in some capacity you know so yeah 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 and realistically when you're feeling in love you don't feel the need to create as much, not that you can't, but it's more just like, oh man, life's so good. But when you really need it the most is when you're going through the darkness. Cause that's, that's the thing that leads you to the light. So it's like, I found that so much more of my music is made during those darker periods to help me get out of the suffering. To help it helps me you escape. like release that negative energy when you're not necessarily trying to release the positive in love feelings. And the one thing I will say on that is I feel like people get a little bit more out of someone's songs that are suffering because they might be suffering more, you know, it's like you're in love, you already feel great. Like you could have a song play that helps reflect that. But when you're really in a dark place, those True. are- I listen to Camelot when I'm feeling sad. <laughs> the old stuff with Roy Khan. <laughs> it's fucking sad, bro. The people who need to be lifted up the most. So it's, it's like- You need it. You need Yeah, need that's it. where like- Now he's like a born again Christian because I think he struggled with drug usage and shit. Camelot's still pretty good though. I just prefer Roy's uh, old lyrics. Like, and that's why you always get the messages, you know, like- I get so many messages of people being like, you saved my life. Like this music was the thing that got me out of this darkness. And you know, whether that's true or not is out of the conversation. It's just, you can tell in general. It's nice to hear, but what I, I appreciate that though, where he's like, whether it's true or not to me, that indicates that he understands that it may not necessarily be true. Because again, there are people who are lost and they're looking for somebody to find them. And um, you know, it doesn't, it could be your music. It could be fucking Taylor Swift. Sometimes you know, they just found you first. And it's like, wow, this is a person I could finally resonate with. And it makes me feel better. Um, but it still feels nice to hear stuff like that. People are suffering and they are lifted up by those darker songs more than the material that's like, oh, I'm so in love, baby, perfect. And it's like, cool, we're already in that good mood if we're in that place of mind. But when you're in the darkness is when you need to be having someone help lift you up. Making art in general, you're putting yourself out there, you know? So people are gonna shit on you no matter what. (laughs) Who cares? You know, people are gonna judge you in life. And I find it's much easier to just be able to take a deep breath. Remind yourself who you are, what you do, what you stand for, what you live for in that moment or constantly changing and evolving and growing. And people don't resonate with that version of you at that moment. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You can evolve and change and devolve as well in the case of your buddy Ian. 
<laughs> Total devolution, de-evolution, devolution. Wait, are you guys friends still? Yeah, yeah. We, we. I don't know if you heard the news. We brought Smosh back. Oh, that's the Smosh guy. Oh, Smosh. Okay, that makes sense. I still don't understand. We talked about this in a different segment. It was so weird. I thought it was a lie. What? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We're back, dude. It's what? crazy. Dude, I didn't know if it was true. You're I gonna be in a video soon with us. Right? I'm gonna be in a video? Are you not? We were pitching it. What the? It. Let's <laughs> go! <laughs> we pitched it to you. I thought you said you are down. I'm in. Let's go. Oh, when you're in a dark place, it's easy to get programmed true. I didn't even think of it like that. Yeah, that's a good point, man. That's, uh, that's fucked up, but it's kind of true. True. Do it. Let's do it right now. We got the set downstairs. Let's go. I'm ready. <laughs> you didn't know that shit? No, I did. I'm with you. Damn. <laughs> Look at this character acting. Fuck is <laughs> Look no, at this no. character. I mean, come on. I was... That was believable? <laughs> A little bit. Okay. A little bit. Well, I'm trying to, I tried to make. Well, I mean, he did go on this whole tangent about a story where his, uh, him, his label and some other, somebody else's label were fighting over the legalities of using a song. So it kind of gives you the idea that he's very disconnected from his own schedule sometimes. So I could see why people would believe it. That was I mean, the, like the least, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. But the, the new album, you gave me a preview of the new album, which just dropped and it's, it seems like it's coming from a lot more of a, there's some romance in there. There's some there's some positive wow. in love lyrics in there. Right, and that's the thing. I always would be falling in love and then I forget to document it. And this time around, I was like, I gotta capture some of this because love. this moment comes and goes. And if I don't catch this right now, especially when it's blooming at the earlier phases of it, that's when it's the most intense as far as like the realization. And I feel like every time we fall in love, it feels like we're falling in love for the first time again. It's so powerful. And mm -hmm. so it's as if you've never fallen in love. And so I was like, wow, I really need to really document it this time and not go out of my way to do it. But I just made sure, hey, I'm going to go a little extra right now and try to try to capture this because it's always the other way around where I'm like, oh, man, I feel so great. And I'm going to enjoy this. And then I forget to document it. And then I'm like, oh, here I am picking up the pieces. And then I'm like trying to bring myself back up after falling down so lowly after my heart's been broken or, you know, it didn't work out. Yeah, so it's so it's difficult for you to remember to take those snapshots. This time I said, hey, I'm going to take a photo. Uh -huh. I want to yeah. capture it. That's, a, that's an interesting relationship with your relationship. I wonder if that has a negative impact. When like, you're in love and then you try to document it in a way to have an impact on your work. Because again, I always talk about how content creators, myself included, can struggle with boundaries and... It's a, it's a stress. It can put a stress on your relationship. But it has for my, my, with my wife, right? In general, it's something that we've overcome, obviously. But it can have a negative impact um, because there sometimes is a boundary issue. Sometimes you put too much out there, and it, it gets difficult to navigate perfectly. And I wonder if something similar happens with the music. I mean, I don't see why not, especially if your content might be about your relationship. You know, divulging something that might that other person either fa makes them look unfavorable or divulges information that they're not ready for anybody to know. Mm, I wonder. For once, uh -huh. I always have all these sad songs. Yeah. When do I get to make a happy one? What do you think are some of the biggest ways that people are misinformed about you? Do you have any specific examples? I, mean, I guess with... everybody kind of thinks he's just trolling. That's, that's I guess that's my miss my misinformation. People have ideas about you that are just completely like where the fuck did that even come from? I had dated another artist and sure. um, when we broke up, her the fans boys. came after me and she had asked them, "Hey guys, please let Oliver be." We're on little good. body, big heart. Who the fuck is that? Little body, big heart. Who's this? Um. What the fuck? What the fuck is this? What the fuck? What the fuck was that? I'm sorry, I'm just a little confused right now. What the fuck? All right, well, that was interesting. Uh, I've never heard of them before, but they had 14 million followers. God bless them, but that was interesting terms and crazy enough that just made more people be sending me more death threats and more things which i have no idea even how that is the response to asking someone to leave you alone she released the album recently and um her fans speculated that it was about me and they started making you know all different types of crazy stories she responded in comment sections on tiktok also being like hey the album's not about him this song this thing that you think is about him is not about him and it's been something Bro, that's social just media kind is of wild because you know what people get out of a relationship and then people will just speculate on that forever and you really just lose so much personal like aspect you know i don't know especially like, if you're somebody who's shitty on the internet you know people always change and grow and i just feel like there's no place for that on the internet it's fucking wild man
That's fucked up. Brought me to a pretty severe place of depression. And um, I don't like to talk about that stuff. I don't like to show that, but the reality is like, people don't realize that what they say or do has an impact on people. They think it's not heard. I think that they want it to though. So they probably do realize it. They just don't, they just don't care because they're pieces of shit. Or not noticed, but um, yeah, it fucks people up. So how do you recover from that feeling like, you know, there's, there's masses of people that have an opinion about you that you've confirmed is not valid, that the other person in the situation is confirmed is not valid. Well, what was the album about that was like so crazy? And the more that it's brought up, the more hate gets directed at you. How do you recover from that and continue moving forward? For one, I just had to get off the internet. I think I stayed off for like three or four months, which isn't enough time. I would prefer to just not be on the internet, but part of my job yeah, when there is an album that. cycle is to be on the internet. So I had to go back on obviously after a long enough period. And one of the things is just working on your mental health, you know, putting my energy into Fuck. my creations and my dreams and not being focused on, you know, all the negativity I could look forever and find people to hate me for any reason, whether it's the way I look, who they think I am, what they think I've done. Um, but the truth is that that's not going to help me make more art to inspire more people to do more with my lifetime. It's just going to make me curl up into a ball and feel like I never want to go outside. So for me, it started with just cleansing myself off the internet, just being focused on creation, which is what I do and why I got into making stuff. What's something you wish you would have known when you first got started? Well, I think that we live with this idea that we are going to get there and we will arrive. But the thing is, whenever you are doing a job like that, the bar just keeps going further and further away. So no matter what, no matter where you go, like, me and my managers would talk and be like, when are we going to do it next year? Are we going to finally get it? And then we're like, next year. And that's every year. What the fuck? I guess, yeah, I can kind of resonate with that. I mean, I was doing pretty well last year and, uh, you know, and I just, I didn't feel good enough. And now that I'm taking a step back, um, it's made me feel like, wow, like I was doing pretty well and I wasn't, I've never been happy with my success. And so as I rebuild, trying to learn to be, happy with some of my success but yeah even like when we get to the thing that we were hoping to get to it's like next year it's gonna get good just wait till next year and it's kind of this like thing where at a certain point you stop talking about it because you're like next year is never coming like this is it it's always like let's just enjoy this and then what happens too is you reach a certain point and i've gotten little tastes of this point but it hits over a certain point and you're like looking back that was the golden part or oh that was the good stuff i i wish we could have just soaked it up more because now the pressure is even bigger and now you're, there's much more risk and it just feels like more of a job. So I think that in general, being really enjoying the moments as they happen and not having this Enjoy idea that it's going to arrive because there is no arrival. I think when you die, that's the arrival. What are you looking forward to most given the fact that you know that it's not about reaching that goal? You know, you, you, you have this album you just dropped. You're about to go on a worldwide tour. Yep. I'm excited to explore, meet new people. I'm excited to make the next album. I'm excited to make some of these feature films because I know for me, the, the actual process of making the art is far more exciting than the actual end result. Like the journey of just making it and the process of it is the high. And so for me, mm. I'm coming to terms with just trying to take more moments to soak it up and enjoy it. Just be there, be present. Mm -hmm. It's going to be over shortly. Very shortly. Just like this interview. <laughs> the interesting end. Okay. Um, wow. Is and it then, literally a... Bowl? Yeah, well, it's a chili bowl is the term. Oh, okay. And we put the bowl on. It's bigger than a cereal bowl because my head is very large. It's abnormally sized. So right. I have a pretty big size head to begin with. Like, All right. Well, I guess they're talking about how they do his haircut. I just shaved mine all off because I'm a bald motherfucker. Okay. Well, that was an interesting segment. Uh, it was kind of nice to get a little educated on Oliver Tree.